Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining the Impro's Colorectal Council Screening, Evidence-Based Recommendations and Best Practices. Your host for today, Julie Campbell, will begin. Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar presented by Empro. This event is part of our Michigan Cancer Control Initiative, which aims to improve cancer screening rates throughout Michigan. If you'd like to learn more, please visit our cancer control website at cancercontrol.empro.org. If you would like to download a copy of today's slides, they'll be uploaded to the same website location. That's cancercontrol.empro.org under the Cancer Control section. Today's speaker is Dr. Kim Turgeon, Professor of Internal Medicine within the Division of Gastroenterology at the University of Michigan Health System. She'll be talking with us today about evidence-based recommendations and best practices related to colorectal cancer screening. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Turgeon. Uh Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I uh, just want to start by saying that I have no disclosures of conflict of interest uh, for this uh, talk today. Um, so today our objectives are going to be to how to identify the clients that are at risk, identify um, options for appropriate screening, um, discuss barriers, and strategize on how we want to increase screen screening rates or how we can increase screening rates, and, and um, uh, look at some opportunities to increase them within people's own offices. So um, the first thing I want to show is this is just a diagram of the colon. And remember, the colon is everything from the rectum to the tip of the appendix. All that is lined with colonic mucosa and is at risk for uh, colorectal cancer. Um, so I think one of the important points is that uh, cancer uh, begins asymptomatically in the early stage, and certainly when it's a polyp or precancerous lesion, it is totally asymptomatic. And um, it's very slow growing. We think it probably takes five to ten years for a polyp, an adenomatous polyp that wants to become a colon cancer, to actually make all those changes. And um, colon cancer um, and uh, precancerous adenomatous polyps can be found and removed um, uh, in very early stages or even before it becomes a colon cancer, and therefore you can prevent uh, colon cancer from happening. Um, I think who is at risk? Uh, there are a lot of misconceptions um, in the public. It affects both men and women. It um, increases, uh, risk increases after the age of 50. It increases uh, based on certain things in your family, but people with average risk are also still at risk. Uh, just because you don't have these things is an important point to get to uh, clients that they're still at risk. And um, uh, the other important point is that colon cancer is preventable and treatable. Um, so uh, when I was um, uh, uh, starting this talk, um, uh, the U.S. Uh, Preventing Task Force just had its draft out, but um, actually just last week they came out with the final publication, and I'll talk to you. It's the same as the draft, and I'll talk to you about the evidence behind it. Um, so uh, right now they're recommending uh, people between the age of 50 and 75 uh, should be uh, screened, that um, 
uh, that people over 75 to 85 can be considered for screening based on their health and their risk factors. And um, uh, people who have either a personal history of polyps or colonic adenomas or a family history of uh, colon cancers should be screened, um, start screening before the age of 50. So right now for screening tests, we divide them into two different groups. The first group of tests are tests that look for hidden blood in the stool. These are all at-home tests. Um, uh, either the high sensitivity FOBT, the FIT tests, which are immunochemical tests for blood in the stool, and then Cologuard, uh, which is a DNA um, uh, and FIT test combined. Uh, the second group of tests are those that look inside the colon which would be sigmoidoscopy uh, with or without FOBT train uh, testing. The um, task force doesn't comment on um, including Cologuard with this as a recommendation. It hasn't been out long enough. And then uh, plain uh, uh, colonoscopy. The other thing to note is that in the new guidelines that are accepted, the U.S. Pre uh, Preventive Service Task Force has now changed sigmoidoscopy to every 10 years and with a uh, FIT test, not an FOBT, annually. Um, so our next uh, slide is who is in this average risk group um, that uh, we want to prevent colon, colon cancer in. And this is 80%, 85% of the population. And any of these recommendations, um, either in group one or group two, would be acceptable as screening for them, uh, for them. And most people can be offered uh, a stool test if that's uh, uh, better for them. Uh, the average risk group is this group of men and women between the age of uh, 50 and uh, 75 who have no personal history and no family history of uh, uh, colon cancer and also that have no symptoms. So uh, people with symptoms or people with family history, uh, the next set of recommendations and the ones we've just gone over, uh, 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 and I'll go over again, don't apply. So, again, we can divide them into uh, options um, for uh, patients at average risk. And um, the first group are these at-home tests that can be uh, performed by the patient. Um, a high sensitivity fecal occult blood is economical. Uh, the FIT test has less dietary uh, and medication restricted and so that they don't have to prep before the test like they would for FOBT. But both tests must be done annually the Cologuard with the fecal DNA, it includes a fit in it, um, but it doesn't need to be done annually. That can be every three years. Um, the thing to make patient, clear to patients is that all positive tests must have a colonoscopy, and the rate of positivity may be as high as 10% that get uh, the uh, these at-home tests. Um, okay. So, um, the reasons to use these uh, tests 
um, I've discussed under each test, and it has been shown that offering patients options increases the chance of uh, them completing uh, uh, screening. So uh, this is a diagram of uh, the high-sensitivity fecal occult blood test, and uh, the patient would have to um, uh, collect a sample in the toilet, um, either give them a hat um, so that they can then put a stick in the stool and uh, three days in a row or three stools in a row, um, uh, put a sample on it and send it back uh, to the lab. Um, the FI, uh, the FIT test, the immunochemical test, are uh, very simple, similar. They collect, they have a sample. They don't get it out of the toilet either for this. It's either you put something across the toilet that holds the stool or you put a hat in the toilet. You sample the stool um, and then mail it back again to the, the lab, which um, will uh, run it. Uh, these, this test is nice because it's only one stool, uh, stool one day. It's... Um, uh, not three stools, and you don't have to change your diet uh, beforehand. Um, with either of these tests, it's not okay to obtain the sample in the office with a digital rectal exam. Um, uh, digital rectal exams commit 90% of even advanced neoplasms. It gives the patient and the doctor a false sense of security, and there are also lots of false positives that will then need um, uh, colonoscopy just because of the way the sample was collected. Uh, so um, office testing is not a substitute. And the other thing to make clear to patients um, is that no matter how many negative tests you try to run after that, a positive is a positive. And until you have a negative colonoscopy, it doesn't eliminate the first positive test. So you can't just keep redoing it till you get the answer you want. Um, I think it skipped a slide here that I wanted to show you. Yeah. These are the tests now that are no, rec no longer recommended as being high-quality tests. So if you have these in your office, um, you need to uh, get rid of them because they're no longer deemed suitable for screening. So the second group of tests in these average risk patients is the tests that look inside the colon. And... Um, uh, We've already meant. Oops, I skipped ahead. We've we've already mentioned that that would be colonoscopy every ten years, or flexible sigmoidoscopy every uh, ten years now, um, based on the new guidelines. And you can add uh, a high sensitivity FOBT uh, every three years. Uh, to the flex sig or a fit test if um, if you want. Um, so now let's move on to the increase in high risk uh, populations uh, uh, that need colorectal cancer screening. Uh, these are people with personal histories of colon cancer or adenomatous polyps. Uh, there are people who have a first-degree relative with um, uh, colorectal cancer. Uh, and then the high-risk group are all the people with symptoms as well as uh, people with known polyposis syndromes 
and people with inflammatory bowel disease that puts them at higher risk for uh, colorectal cancer. Um, I just wanted to, some of you may do FlexSigs in your office, um, but if you don't, this is a picture on, of uh, a scope. Uh, this is an old scope because you can see it's a fiber optic scope, this picture. And now everything's shown on um, a, a screen and it's done with video chip technology. But the idea is uh, the same. Uh, one end plugs into the um, lighting equipment and um, the other end is inserted into uh, the rectum and the scope is flexible, flexible and manipulated throughout the colon. There. Um, so these are polyps that I have personally um, seen in the past and removed and taken pictures. And what I wanted to point out in that that sometimes it's quite obvious, like uh, the polyp in the upper right-hand corner um, or the polyp in the upper left-hand corner or the polyp in uh, the, the uh, lower right and left, uh, right and middle uh, um, uh Polyps. But sometimes it's very set, uh, very subtle. And so there's the polyp uh, there. Um, I unfortunately I don't have a pointer um, in the lower left hand corner uh, picture that you could see could easily be missed or covered up with just a small amount of water or mucus. And even the polyp in the middle upper column um, could be covered over with liquid or stool and possibly mist. Um, uh, and this is what we're trying to prevent, uh, colon cancer. And all of these are examples of colon cancers that I've found. Um, so what my prevent, what are the potential harms of uh, doing uh, colonoscopy as screening for, for everybody? Um, the, they, the prep may cause dehydration. Um, the sedation may be risky in people with more cardiopulmonary uh, diseases. Um, Polypectomy has the risk of bleeding. Uh, polypectomy and sometimes the scope itself has the risk of perforation. And so um, it may not be that one size fits all. Um, age also increases risk for colon cancer but increases um, risk for complications. And if you have to decide who you're going to screen. If if they're not um, healthy enough to have uh, surgery or treatment of a colon cancer or healthy enough to have a colonoscopy and removable of a polyp, um, then we shouldn't even be screening them. Um, Currently, when you ask providers what they think, um, they will tell you uh, this was a study done by the National Colon Cancer Roundtable that 92% of providers think colonoscopy is highly effective, that 25% uh, like uh, FIT, and only 10% like FOBT. Um, uh, colonoscopy is still the preferred recommendation um, uh, for everybody, although it may not be readily available and it may be uh, financially not appropriate 
everywhere. When you look at patients, and, and this is a study uh, that was done, published in 2013 of almost 1,000 men and women, um, and only 58% had completed a, a colorectal screening test. Um, and our goal is with the American Cancer Society and uh, with the Michigan um, State Health Department is that we get 80% of people screened in Michigan by 2018. So this was prior to 2013, only 58% had a screening test. Um, uh, 38% of them were colonoscopies that were com completed. FOBT, 67%, um, but if they were given a choice between uh, whether they'd like an at-home test or they'd like a um, look at their colon, 69% completed uh, their uh, screening. Um, in this study, when they looked at it by races, um, African Americans had the lowest completion of screening rates. Um, so uh, right now, this, what I have listed as a draft that came out in uh, October of 15, has just been published in uh, and um, uh, in uh, November of uh, 16, and uh, there and now both the Canadian task force was was published in February of 16 it is now very similar as you'll see to this draft and what has become uh, the new recommendations from the U.S. Preventive Health Task Force. Um, and again, as we've discussed. Uh, uh, average risk people age 50 to 75 uh, should be screened with any of these methods starting at the age of uh, uh, 50. Uh, the older population, that choice is a very individual one. It's based on their overall health, their prior screening history, and um, uh, and the fact that adults that are older, if they've never been screened before for colon cancer, are more likely to benefit even in this older age group. Okay. I'm sorry, my uh, advanced button isn't picking up all the time. There we go. Um, so uh, the other thing that's changed from the old guidelines to the new guidelines now is that um, uh, flexible sigmoidoscopy is the move to every 10 years with the addition of having a fit every uh, year. Uh, colonoscopy still remains every 10 years. Uh, screening. Okay. Um, so uh, the this slide shows the recommendations from Canada uh, in February, which now are very consistent with our new 2016 um, uh, uh, U.S. preventive. Uh, services task force guidelines. Um, so how can we increase colorectal cancer screening rates in our practices as well as in the state? Um, and there, we know that options really help um, people uh, decide to commit to a uh, screening program and complete it, but we also have uh, some um, suggestions for uh, uh, 
uh, clients as well as providers, and I'll go on to uh, talk about those. Um, okay, so what have we learned? This slide shows what we've learned from breast cancer, cervical cancer, and now comparing it to colon cancer screening. So we have really good uh, evidence, and it's recommended that client reminders, so postcard to the office or a reminder at their appointment when they're due next for their screening, um, even by the intake staff, um, has been uh, useful. That uh, small media has been uh, useful for all three of the cancer screenings. Um, we have evidence that group education in breast cancer has been very useful, and I suspect soon that that will be true for colon cancer. We know one-in-one -one education is important. Removing the structural barriers is, are important to both colon cancer as well as uh, breast cancer. Um, and uh, uh, I suspect we'll have evidence soon that if we can reduce the out-of-pocket expenses for uh, colon cancer screening, uh, we will be able to increase our screening rates. When you look at providers, um, provider um, assessment, so looking at their pool of patients and just showing them their screening rates and giving them this feedback is helpful um, in colon cancer. And, and giving them a way to, of reminders and recall systems is also helpful to having them increase their uh, colon cancer screening rate. So uh, client-oriented um, uh, uh, strategies can be simple. It's even just having a discussing their risks and discussing the benefit of colorectal cancer screening, giving them options, and identifying what their barriers are so that you can then suggest an option that might be more consistent with their their own individual uh feelings about uh, screening. Um, so I, these are my personal tips. I do feel that education of the patient about the risk of colon cancer as well as their own individual risk is very important. But to reduce barriers, I think uh, especially for colonoscopy, um, is to remind them, you know, that they don't have to just drink um, uh, water with their prep. They can use hot and cold liquids. A lot of times people put their prep in the refrigerator so it's chilled, and some people think it tastes better that way, but then what happens is the person is drinking a whole gallon of chilled liquid and will cool their core temperature down and start uh, um, shivering. And so I like to tell them that it's okay to have hot water, a glass of hot tea, the, um, some uh, bouillon, all of that that's warm is included in the clear liquid diet. I, I think we have to be careful about our preps and understand that um, peg-based preps like go lightly, new lightly, et cetera, um, uh, it's the generic peg-based preps uh, need to be used in people with congestive heart failure and renal failure to prevent um, uh, fluid overload and um, uh, electrolyte disturbance from the prep. But the pill prep in people with 
uh, no congestive heart failure and no renal fail- failure sometimes works well. And and sometimes when I tell them about the pill prep and tell them that it ends up being 32 pills that they have to swallow and that the pills are rather large, like um, the size of a calcium supplement, they go back and say, well, the liquid doesn't sound so bad. A lot of times people will say, well, I get nauseated if I drink that much or the last time I had vomiting. And I would like to give the option to people of that I would write them a prescription for an antiemetic. And often I have them take their first Zofran dose, if they're afraid of that, prior to starting the prep, and then they can continue it if they get nauseated as uh, things go on. Um, uh, I also tell people that the instructions are one size fits all and they're an individual person. So I recommend that people really, if they're worried about consuming the volume, start earlier, go slowly, use warm as well as cold beverages uh, with the prep. Um, and um, uh, not to rush, and I feel that that generally goes better. Uh, there are many promising things in the future. At this year's um, American College of Gastroenterology meetings, uh, um, there was an abstract uh, about a meal-based prep, and I think uh, at the university we are going to become a site for a national study, multi-center study on these meal uh, preps where the prep would be given to the patient as um, uh, shakes they could drink and uh, protein bars they could eat, and they'd be assigned that as a meal with drinking throughout, um, which seems to appeal to uh, many patients. Um, I think the, the other important thing for your office staff and you as a physician is to have three to five talking points about colorectal cancer, that risk increases with age, and that age is 50, and we need to start screening at 50, that for advanced stage, um, or that for colon cancers as well as polyps, um, polyps are asymptomatic, and colon cancers don't get symptomatic until they are at very advanced stages. Um, it's also important that colon cancer is preventable. If you remove all the adenomas, nobody has a chance to get a colon cancer. And they're treatable if even if they've already developed into cancer, if they're found early. Um, and that for average risk people, I would, in, I would give them the choice of what kind of screening they would prefer, and they're more likely to participate. So, as I've been saying for the last 20 years, the best screening option is the one that gets done, not the one that ends up either in the garbage can at home or in a stack of papers uh, in a, you know, closet somewhere. Um, that, that lack of knowledge about it, and it is a barrier, and if we can educate people, that increases our chances of having them complete their screening. But if we could remove the ick factor to screening um, uh, and talk about it as in a very plain, matter-of-fact way that they can do this at home, on their own, show them examples, not have them feel like they're playing with their stool at home. Um, we have a better chance with the stool-based test. Um, that um, if we can discuss with them what their insurance covers, 
what would be the financial cost of each of the op- options. Um, I think fear of the unknown and is part of a barrier, and that's why we need to educate our our patients, that some of the barrier is cultural, um, and we need to try to break that down. There are um, also uh, little things we can do, like figuring out is transportation really the barrier? What's stopping them? Is there a way we can help them with that or brainstorm on how uh, they could get uh, transportation uh, to a colonoscopy? Um, Is it the time out of their schedule? I've had um, many business owners that all I had to do was find them a time where I could do their procedure on a weekend, a Saturday, and they were fine. The barrier was really that they couldn't leave their job. Um, And often the, the less complicated the procedure or the more straightforward we can make it um, uh, seem, Um, and help them with their choice, uh, the uh, more likely we are to have them complete uh, screening uh, procedures. So I wanted to um, uh, give you some familiarity with, um, with things that one can institute in your own office. Uh, there's a website called uh, MIO, which is the acronym for Make It Your Own, that offers you uh, the ability to make your own screening material for your own office um, that are relatively personalized, like letters or postcards or brochures, flyers, posters that you can hang in your office or hand out to patients. Um, office newsletters. Um, so let me show you some example of this. This is a Mayo um, example, and where Mayo is, you can personalize all of these to put your own office information and um, and talk about screening that can either be hung up in your office or. Uh, Send out to patients when they turn uh, 50. Here's another example of a flyer that can be put up or sent and individualized to have your own logos and your own office information. Um, Here's another one. They have a variety of languages that you can individualize um, uh, the message you want to send. Uh, to patients, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, it can be even something that the intake person gives them to read while they're waiting in uh, the office. So I think taking a look at this website and figuring out what you think would work best for your office and your patients um, uh, 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 uh could be very useful to you. I'm having trouble forwarding again, let's see. There. So um, all these things like um, uh, 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 print or telephone or email reminders, uh, labeling them with the return address to your lab so not just with their name and they have to label it, but do the whole process so when it comes to your lab, you know, know uh, uh, you know where it came from as well as it gets to your lab. Um, and they can mail it uh, and don't have to bring it in. To track what you've given out and follow up with them by phone or by email if it's not returned, uh, so that you can remind them um, to, in the office, discuss their options with them and insist them in scheduling appointments 
if they choose uh, the um, flight figure colonoscope option. And then uh, sometimes giving them a reminder call, making sure that they 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 have their prep and they're starting it and that they have a driver and they they remember when their appointment is. I think structural bar barriers uh, are things like, um, you know, office hours, like uh, when I do a Saturday endoscopy clinic, um, uh, uh, you know, having meetings for your practice or educational meetings for the public from your practice about colorectal screening and why it's important to make sure you have translation services that find ways you can brainstorm in the system with transportation or with child care or elder care if that's their barrier. Um, and um, anything we can do to uh, for financial assistance, and and for that that might be just in your office handing out um, the the cards um, and uh, so that they have no cost other than to get it uh, back to your office to doing the test and getting it back to your office. You can pre-label and pre-stamp uh, the return labels. Um, anything to reduce the barriers uh, that you're, and the reasons you aren't getting uh, the screening done. I think for providers, it's important to know your own um, office screening rates and, and get feedback on that, that your goal, um, like everyone in Michigan, is to try to achieve that 80% screening rate by 2018. Um, with this goal in mind, we can really um, uh, save a lot of lives um, and save a lot of uh, morbidity. And, uh, um, there are things now, if you have an electronic medical record, um, that you can see if they can be programmed into reminding you about colorectal uh, cancer screening. Uh, the chart can be, work on a way that the chart can be flagged. So if you have paper charts, so that um, even the front desk or the people putting them back can start the conversation, whether it's with a flyer or just reminding them that they're due uh, and something to read before the uh, uh, provider comes into the office. Um, and working with you in your office to de develop a po policy on what would work best for your author office operations. And understand that screening uh, begins at the front desk, and with every staff uh, patient comes into contact with, um, but that a lot of these uh, things you can actually give them the kits, uh, call or send out a card with a reminder if it hasn't been returned, uh, scheduling as many appointments if they're going uh, the route of um, uh, tests that uh, see inside the colon, um, before they leave the office, some offices uh, even try to work out ways to give the prep there um, and make reminder calls. So whatever uh, system, but having a system, uh, that works for your office is good. Um, the, you know, main thing is that we have to spread the word about colon cancer and how colon cancer screening uh, saves lives as well as prevents cancer. Um, I've uh, left you with some references 
uh, that you can look up um, uh, for um, uh, for resources for yourself and for the office. Um, a lot of these resources have printed guidelines and um, uh, that you can print out and uh, have on hand in your office or laminate and put up on uh, a board or your exam rooms. Um, here's some more resources. Again, I'm not going forward. There. Um, uh, for you. And I'm happy to entertain questions and uh, uh, start the discussion right here. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions at this time, please press the number one key. Again, if you have any questions at this time, please press the number one key. And I'm waiting for callers to join the queue at this present time. All right, while we're waiting for any questions, I just wanted to thank you again very much, Dr. Turgeon. Um, we'd also like to make the evaluation questions available for all attendees. Um, so if you could take a moment to let us know your thoughts on today's session. We do use participant feedback from these evaluations in order to focus future learning sessions. Thank you. We didn't have any callers in queue at this present time. All right. I did actually have a question um, for you, Dr. Turgeon. Um, a while ago when you were talking about um, the roundtable study that was done and kind of gauging clinicians' preference for different colorectal cancer screening tests, um, it does seem like colonoscopy is still kind of viewed as a gold standard for CRC screening. Um, but like you said, there are a lot of patient barriers to actually having that testing done. Do you see any value in using um, the group one at home test to narrow the pool of patients who might actually need a colonoscopy for diagnostics and then in that way we're, you know, focusing on patients that we want to test as colonoscopies? Well, I what I see is that that was based on uh, a survey of physicians, okay? Um, I think what's been proven is the more options we can give our clients, the better they are the better we're going to achieve screening for everybody and that and that both procedures i mean in home as well as um, looking in the colon have their barriers some people don't like um thinking about touching their stool or doing anything like that some people the barrier is that, oh, I can't take aspirin or eat red meat for so many days before this test. So by showing them the options and um, letting them explain to you how they personally feel about it, you can help them make that choice. And I feel that screening is screening, and our goal is to get, you know, Everyone screened ideally, but we'll go for 80% by 2018, and um, and that. But up front, they have to know that um, any positive tests on the at-home tests will uh, make a colonoscopy mandatory. That you can't just, no matter how many negative tests you have after that you can't erase a positive test, even if it was performed incorrectly. It needs to be followed up with colonoscopy. So does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I definitely like what you were saying about patient education, and I like the example that you gave of um, spending some time talking with a patient and finding that structural barriers was actually an issue. So, yes, yeah, thank you. I think that's really important. Do we have any other questions at this time? We do not have any more questions in queue at this present time. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions or comments, please press the number one key. Again, if you have any questions, please press the number one key. Ladies, there's no questions in queue. All right. Thank you. And thank you again so much, Dr. Turgeon, for your talk today. 
And also thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today for colorectal cancer screenings, evidence-based recommendations, and best practices. Um, like I mentioned before, the slides from today's presentation will be available on our website and also our YouTube page within the next week. And also be sure to join us for our upcoming webinar on January 10th, Smoking Cessation Counseling Within the Clinical Setting. And that's going to be held at the same time from noon to 1 p.m. And if there aren't any more questions, um, I'd just like to thank everyone again. Thank you again, Dr. Turgeon, and I hope that everyone has a great day. I would like to say thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining this completes your conference call. You all just connect and have a great day as well.